Our next speaker is Moldover. Moldover, thanks for joining us. Um, uh, uh, he's going to be talking about what sounds like cool music installations he's done in Las Vegas. Moldover is one of the originators of controllerism. He makes amazing musical instruments, uh, electronic musical instruments that are a little bit beyond your usual keyboard and guitar business. And um, I wait to see what he has to say. So hey. um, Moldover, are you ready? I'm ready. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Great. Great. Thank you, John. Thanks, Karen and James, also for hosting. Uh, I'm really excited to be back at Dorkbot. It's been a little while, and my first <clears throat> virtual Dorkbot. So um, this will be interesting. Um, this is also the first time I've really talked publicly about this project. I worked on it for over three years, if you can even um, say I stopped working on it because I'm still doing stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm really excited to uh, share it with you. I'm going to start by um, talking a little bit about who I am and what I do. And I prepared a slideshow because everyone loves a slideshow. And does that look good? Great. Thank you. OK, that's my name, Moldover. You know that. Um, yeah, some people know me as the godfather of controllerism, which mostly involves sitting around in a three-piece suit and having a smoke machine behind me, but um, it also involves uh, working along with music and musical instruments of a technological nature, and that's that's my passion, so um, that's why uh, that's why Godfather of Controllerism. Um, briefly, like, I just want to play a little music, so here's like 15 seconds of a song and a music video with me thrashing around in the rain. Uh, hopeless, weakness, Slow suicide Shut me down Shut me out Yeah, so that's the stuff I love and um, that's what led me towards making instruments. As you can hear, I've got kind of a traditional musical sound um but i love performing solo i love performing electronic music and like augmenting it so i started making instruments that are augmented An augmented microphone augmented guitar um and the thing in the upper right hand corner called the mojo um those are the things i used to perform with um these are my albums which are also instruments that one on the left is a light theremin in a cd case and the one on the right is called a voice crusher um, these are instruments I build for other instrument, uh, other artists. This is one of my um, my primary gigs is like designing and building stuff either for companies or artists or um, sometimes organizations like Meow Wolf. So those are some of the artists and instruments that I have um, built for others. And um, one of the wackier categories of instruments I make are things I call jam boxes and other people call jam boxes. Um, and they're basically multiplayer instruments. This is the first one I made a while back called the Octomasher. It was sold to a good friend up in Ottawa. Um, that's the Mini Masher and the Cinco Masher. Um, also, uh, well, one of those is uh, in North Carolina and the other is for sale if you want a jam box of your own. Just throwing that out there. Um, but these are all um, like, I guess I call them prototypes. Um, all of these were built kind of piecemeal. They were just things I kind of dreamed up. And they look pretty nice in these photos, but this is after like multiple years of evolution and uh, generations of improvement. So what was really exciting is three-ish years ago when somebody from Meow Wolf contacted me and was like, hey, we want to commission you to build um, something like that for our new exhibit in Las Vegas called Omega Mart. Um, <clears throat> fast forward to now and Omega Mart is open in Las Vegas. You can go there. Uh, right now and um, and experience all this crazy stuff. Um, here are some photos of what it looks like. It's like a supermarket with all kinds of whimsical products and you can open all kinds of portals in this uh, supermarket and go into a factory and an office space, which doesn't sound really exciting, but they're full of room after room after room of bespoke, uh, incredible immersive narrative artworks and it's um it's just uh, an amazing art experience so it's it's like one of the greatest um experiences in my life to be involved um with this crew and with this uh, exhibit this is the second thing they've done there's there's one in santa fe already and there's a third one actually opening in denver later this year so um meow wolf is is very exciting to me 
this is the thing I made. It's called the music mill. So this is a jam box um, as opposed to being built piecemeal, um, totally designed all at once. Um, with a venue and an audience and a theme. It, it kind of fits into the, the factory space in this narrative um, as well. So it was just a really awesome experience to have this, you know, this, this sort of big budget um, and also a big team to work with to bring this thing uh, to life. So I think I have a video. Yeah, this is a video from before it was open. So this is some of the Meow Wolf uh, like team leads actually like trying it out and um, playing it for the first time um, before the exhibit is open and just at the end of my uh, phase of like setting it up in Las Vegas. So I'm gonna forge ahead. I've never done this talk before, of course, and I have a lot I want to share. So I might cut off um, a couple of videos. But I think I think it's really fun to show. This is like the initial sketch of the thing, like borrowing some ideas from older jam boxes, trying to adapt it to the factory that um, that I imagined it being placed in. Um, some rough 3D models that I made uh, with Fusion 360. So that was kind of like part of the proposal process. Um, after the proposal was accepted, I started prototyping. Um, I picked out the kind of sensors that I wanted to use for people to input um, their gestures. And over on the left, you can see this Akai pad controller. I love these drum pads because they're, they're pretty intuitive for people to play. They have lights in them for visual feedback. And um, they're pretty expressive. You can, you can um, detect pressure and also how hard they've been hit. So you can program musical expressiveness into them. And below that is uh, a Sensel Morph which is about the size of an iPad, um, but it's a pressure sensitive multi-touch sensor, so also very expressive. And that pile of uh, stuff over on the right is the first prototype of the device. Um, that was another exciting thing was to, to actually go through like play testing and prototyping and like make the thing before I made the thing and try out some wacky concepts. Like you can see there's lots of uh, construction paper and blue painters tape involved <laughs> in some, some testing that's happening there. Um, this is what I was testing, was trying to come up with unconventional patterns of, um, of yeah, touch, touch sensors, like positional touch sensors and these pads that you strike and trying to find um, things that would invite a more playful uh, approach to music and then also like musical organizations of them that would be intuitive. So a big, a big idea behind this was to try and make a musical instrument that's very expressive, you know, has a lot of depth you can actually become an expert at playing, um, but it's also easy for someone with like very little to no musical experience to walk up to and like understand and make music that sounds pleasing to, uh, to the average person's ear. So this is like just imagining all the different um, kind of configurations I can make with these controllers. Um, this is actually connecting it to musical, uh, musical scales did a lot of testing to figure out like, oh, what is what do people play when you put a staircase of notes in front of them? What do people play when you put a symmetrical shape in front of them? And trying to connect that to musical concepts um, employed on different instruments. Um, for example, in the center there, you see the melody instrument. And I use a note arrangement you find on uh, kalimbas and choras, um, these like symmetrical instruments that have um, um, scales when you play a left and a right uh, mirror image. Um, pattern. So anyways, trying to connect sensors to musicality is, is kind of one of my big things. Um, I got involved to a certain degree in kind of the, uh, the, the space around it. Um, in the beginning, I was kind of invited like to do like a room, right? Like, hey, you can have a room. That's what most artists in there are doing. There's a lot more um, visual art and kind of immersive art. Um, and after a little bit of thought and work, I decided like I really just wanted to focus on the instrument. I think of myself as very much an instrument maker. And this, of course, appears to people as like an installation or art, art installation or, or what have you, um, which it totally fits that mold. But um, I didn't want to design the environment. So I invited uh, Meow Wolf 
to kind of like throw stuff at me and that's how we got kind of the size and general shape of the room and then I got my friend Liza Bender involved who did an environment for <clears throat> for a music video like the one you saw earlier uh, for me and so she decided uh, she started designing an environment and wound up making those um, hexagonal infinity mirrors that hang on the walls um, hexagons just turned out to be really useful actually it was all based on I just wanted to make a three-sided instrument because that's like really easy for people to grok is like hearing two other people um, to play with you get four it, it gets to be a little bit much and like two people is a little bit limiting um, but that three grew to be like hexagonal, and it turns out there's there's a lot of synergy with the hexagon. Um, so those are Liza's mirrors, uh, infinity tunnels. I'm sorry. Um, and I worked with my friend Turner Kirk. He had already designed a MIDI controlled uh, lighting driver um, to do some LEDs for mostly for like live stage shows um, for performing uh, bands. And so he revised it and adapted it and actually wound up doing a lot of engineering to like bump up the specs to this very rigid um, specification that uh, Nevada and the city of Las Vegas require, I guess. Um, so he had to re-engineer the whole thing um, for a lot of specific needs and he did great work. And I think I have a little video. Moldover's mini light controller design by Turner Kirk Revision 1, <laughs> which does control of LEDs. In many, many ways. Oh, you know, yeah. could do more fun things. So we can do this, we can do colors, we can do... Movies. So LED uh, drivers aren't that exciting, but having it MIDI controlled is really useful because of some of the software and the working methods that I use, which you'll see later on, um, that are all musical. And MIDI is the musical instrument digital interface, um, which makes it really convenient for um, the, the tools that I work with. Uh, this is the evolution of the physical... Um, device, the console, as we call it, um, from triangular to hexagonal and, and from sketches of what the interfaces would like look like to like really specific interfaces on the bottom there. Um, this is where I got super geeky, was designing the enclosures for these little sub panels, right? So I took each of these, um, you can see there's, there's combinations of sensor panels up there and I developed this like pretty detailed uh, enclosure mostly with um, the interest of making the thing uh, really durable, like really durable. We're talking about like a thousand people are going to play this thing every day for like 10 years. So it's a lot of like steel. I mean, it's all built out of steel and aluminum and polycarbonate, like really tough materials. But even the sensors, you know, you really want to try and like make sure that they're easy to um, uh, repair and replace and also as durable as they can be in the first place. So they'll, they'll just last as long as they can. So I made these um, complicated sandwiches for the sensors and things to protect the sensors and then the masks, you know, to, to make more interesting shapes. I got into like, oh, you know, let's give people triangles. How do people react with triangles? They do interesting things with triangles because you never have a triangular touch screen. But believe me, you should one day, someday. Triangular phones, maybe. Anyway. Um, uh, yeah, all the CAD get, gets translated into 2D things, cut out by uh, CNC machines mostly, um, but then all assembled by hand. So this is putting together these little assemblies to make these unique um, sensor panels. These were like really intricate because I wanted to add lights to these. There, there aren't really, uh, there weren't useful lights in these morph touch sensors. So I built these channelized uh, polycarbonate things that had to be painted to block the light from one to the next. Um, so these are really ca complicated, but in the end I wound up with these, you know, these cool shapes like hexagons and triangles that are touch pressure sensitive, multi-touch sensors, and they also have addressable lighting like around their borders um, for some really cool uh, lighting feedback. Um, this is the sound design uh, station that I made. So I took all of them and I kind of condensed them down to like two controllers. That's um, a morph on the left and that's a, a Linstrument on the right, which I actually have in front of me right here. Can you hear those sounds? Cool. Okay. Um, that's cool because I can use those to show you some sound design in just a minute. But uh, yeah, graphics. I got into some graphic design, picking shapes. Uh, this is showing all the graphics. They were um, all the metal work and this work to like sandblast and paint these graphics and the panels were done by Brian Sullivan, amazing metal worker, fine artist in his own right, um, who has a shop in Emeryville. Um, so he did all the 
the uh, non-computerized metal work, for which there was a lot. A lot of welding, a lot of, like, taking my... I've never really built a 500-pound steel sculpture before <laughs> as steel, um, but he has, so he took my designs and took them to the next level and made them uh, more functional, too. So this is just showing this cool kind of maintenance door system he came up with so that the whole thing just kind of unfolds and you can really easily get in there and uh, and work on the guts of it. So he put piano hinges in there, cables to, to hold it up. So um, yeah, makes it very repairable. These are all these cu custom lighting fixtures all over the thing. Lots and lots of soldering, lots and lots of crimping, many, many LEDs. There you have it. Um, that's what the inside looks like, all lit up. And then I took it to Las Vegas on a rented pickup truck. That video is not that exciting. <laughs> so we'll skip ahead to the software really briefly. So um, I can actually get on this slideshow and show you because I have this unique feature of like running all this stuff. So this is Max where I built this interface that takes in all the sensor data. You can see things moving around because I'm touching sensors in front of me. Um, and kind of like, yeah, it does a lot of logic with it. Um, it deals with some, some cool hidden Easter egg tricks in there. Um, and a lot of uh, working with the LEDs, logic for the LEDs to pick different colors and things based on um, what people are doing, enter attract mode. So it does, it's doing like a cool uh, animation right now in the lower right. You can see the LEDs on the, the pads are lighting up to draw your attention to them because we're in attract mode. And for those that haven't seen Max, it's this, um, it's this uh, yeah, box and line modular programming language so that someone who doesn't code like me can make some custom software. And the other piece of software I'm working with is Ableton Live, um, which is like the sound engine. And I just have gobs and gobs of loops um, and synthesizers. The drums are all loops. Um, there's about 16 loops times four different presets, so there's like a hundred different really carefully designed uh, drum loops that are all kind of pre-mixed, and um, and yeah, and I I don't know what else to say about that, but I'm I'm running out of time, so I would like to take a few questions. I'll just show you two seconds of a video because I finally got some really good video. <laughs> So the work continues uh, to cut together video so I can tell people about this and hopefully um, get more projects like it because, yeah, it was super, super fun. So that's me. That's Adam. Reach me. And then by my calculations, I got a couple minutes. Can I take a question? Are there any questions? Oh, that was super cool. So actually, I have a question. Uh, if people uh, have questions, um, put them in the chat. Um, I have a couple of questions that look really cool. So are you using just the, the, the Akai sensors and you put your own lights and things around them and you put them in, the, in your own, own configuration? Uh, the Akais have lights in them, which is part of why I, uh, I chose them. Not um, uh, but the, the custom lights had to happen for the, the morphs because the morphs, I have one here. Um, it's got a few lights here, but I wanted lights like around each of those shapes so that, especially those, like I just want lights right by your fingers when you touch a thing. It's just easier for people to understand. Yeah, instant feedback. Super cool. So um, uh, you say you've been working this for um, uh, uh, years now. Yeah, yeah. It started in, I mean, everything is confusing with the pandemic, but yeah, it was more than three years ago that the proposal process started, and um, we set it up in January, and the exhibit opened a few weeks after. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, Sherry Huss saying in the chat that she, uh, she'd lo love to get you involved in the Maker Music Festival next year. That looked like- Oh, yeah, absolutely. There's amazing stuff on that. I was not aware of the Maker Music Festival until this year, but I saw so many cool things. I need to go back and- yeah. review. I think they're still are, are still up there, aren't they? Yeah, and uh, a question from um, from uh, Dante. Uh, so there's a max patch running on a computer inside the instrument that does the sound processing? That was a question. Great question. Yeah, max handles all the data. So like all the sensors coming in, 
and controlling all the lights and Ableton handles all of the audio. So playing samples, um, virtual synthesizers, lots and lots of effects that people can control in real time. So it's kind of like those two softwares doing what I think they're best at. Great, and uh, one more question. How do you feel about the results? Uh, how do you feel about the music that others make with your device? Uh, I think it's, it's good. I didn't actually get to spend a lot of time observing people playing it, which I feel like is actually a really important part of the process. Um, I used to think like, oh, I made the thing for people to play. I just walk away and my, my, my work is done. But like to really improve as an instrument maker and, and also to feel like a connection with, with the work that I, I make and the people that it influences, like I need to watch people play it. So I've only done like a very little, little bit of that. And um, I really hope I get to do more, um, hopefully in person. So maybe going back to Vegas um, in the near future, hope. Awesome, great, great, great. Thanks, super cool. I want to play with this thing. Um, one one final question. Did I see in your in your um, Max patch that you have some cheat codes and could you share one or two with us? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I love I love the idea that there's a little hidden thing and that's a big part of the Meow Wolf kind of ethos is having you know multi multiple layers to the art and having like yeah stuff like that. So there's there's information in the panels, uh, the panel graphics I showed you. Some of it's just like eye candy and like the ridiculous names um, for each side of the instrument. But there's also information there that is a cheat code. And if you can coordinate that, that was actually an idea, I think, inspired by Rich TDT. He's done many um, uh, pieces, not so much like this, but pieces that require multiple people to kind of coordinate, you know, very much like a Burning Man uh, collaborative art thing. But it requires everybody around the instrument to kind of like do the cheat. Uh, I want to call it cheat code. It's not really cheating. It's the, it's the Easter egg. But if everybody does the right thing all at the same time, you all hear this crazy cool sound and it unlocks um, a very special uh, feature of the music mill. So I hope you get to get to find that if you get out to Vegas to play it. All right. That's awesome. Thank you.